Good morning. Um, thank you for being here. If you're in this room, you're here for the Community Networks and Connecting the Last Billion, which showcases some of the, the key organizations here in Geneva, um, colleagues from our civil society and community network community, and the work that people are doing on trade, crossing borders, uh, work that's gone on in the past. And we have UNCTAD. We're trying to find some of the nameplates, so sorry. <laughs> uh, UNCTAD, the WTO, ITU, and APC. Um, each of the panelists will introduce themselves and some of the work they've been doing over the last uh, many years to look at liberalization and privatization, provide for better connectivity, look at connectivity and regulatory solutions together with a variety of stakeholders. The bottom line is we know that there are still 49% uh, of the planet unconnected. There are new and innovative ways to do that, but that means that different organizations from government to civil society to the internet technical community to UN organizations are doing a lot of work to help promote better e-commerce, better connectivity, more innovation. And so we're going to take a look at the different aspects of what the organizations have been doing, some of the work they've been up to over the last uh, couple of years, and then brainstorm with you with some Q&A on what we can do together uh, to provide some of those connectivity solutions. And I should say my name is Jane Coffin. I'm with the Internet Society. I'm a senior advisor on connectivity and infrastructure. And I'm going to let the others introduce themselves because they can probably do more justice than I can. And we're going to start with the WTO colleague, Lee Tuthill, and we'll move to UNCTAD, ITU, and APC. Each, each group will introduce themselves and what they're working on, and then we'll go with some questions for the panel. So I will start uh, to my left with Lee Tuthill, who is one of the key people, and I think I've known Lee for over 10, 12 years. Um, if you don't know what the WTO has done to help provide connectivity, privatization, everything from uh, opening up markets, then we're going to start with Lee so that she can give you an idea of what she's been working on. Good morning. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Jane. I'm going to uh, emphasize three of the themes of the topic of this, of this panel. Um, collaboration, um, what we might borrow from some of what WTO has done in the past, and uh, innovative regulation. Now, I, if nobody can remember, in the mid-90s, the WTO had basic telecommunications negotiations um, because the governments were beginning to think about opening up markets. Um, we had two aspects to these negotiations with, which I think are relevant today. One was binding market access commitments uh, for countries, most of, most of which had no market access. I mean, we, with all the members of the WTO at the time, we launched a negotiation to open markets for telecommunications. You could count on less than two hands. There were exactly eight governments who had any market opening for telecom, really, for basic telecom. And most of that was what we would have called partial, partial opening today. And um, what they did that's relevant is they worked not only on that market access side, but also on the regulatory framework. Because, um, in fact, in many cases, brand new regulatory frameworks would be needed. And as with many things I'll, I'll say in my presentation, this wasn't a north-south issue. Uh, Switzerland had a regulator and supplier and uh, ministry that were all one entity. Uh, so it wasn't just uh, developing countries that needed to change the way they were doing things. Um, uh, and that's only one example. Um, what we did that I think made these negotiations work is that the telecom experts from governments were invited to Geneva to work with us. And I watched that dynamic happen, and it's a dynamic I wish I'd like to see again work in the WTO and other places. Uh, we had uh, the, the, often the Geneva-based delegate was sitting side by side with, at the time, a telecom ministry person, many of whom later became uh, staff of one of the first regulators. And the cross-fertilization and, and the sharing of information and getting it right when they looked at regulatory issues that might uh, support market access was very interesting because we were able to come up with best practice 
not because WTO could do it, but because WTO basically collaborated with the experts. Um, now, on, on um, market access, I think the results of that negotiation in the mid-'90s were nothing less than phenomenal. And many regulators around the world felt as though the commitments are locking in the commitments. Uh, and the WTO debate had served as a catalyst for often multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder debates going on in, in capital. So as a catalyst, I think it got people to the point where rather than going back and forth over what to do, when to do it for years, it basically settled that argument and focused everybody's minds. Um, not only did the market access commitments essentially bring connectivity to millions and millions of people, who many of whom never had it at all before, um, it also set up uh, the possibility for companies to come in who immediately went, for example, the mobile companies, to underserved areas or non-served areas, for example, rural areas or people on long waiting lists, even in the capital, uh, to get connectivity. And the competition uh, in all countries brought the prices down, with the possible exception of some of the mobile prepaid services. I had an economist do a study where they said some of these results are counterintuitive because the prices of a prepaid per minute phone call is much higher than a per minute fixed line call. And uh, I think what they didn't understand, that there was some innovation, some regulatory and commercial innovation going on that allowed people to have controllable costs uh, of mobile telephony through prepaid cards, um, rather than take the risk of you know it being something they they couldn't control uh, the cost to what they could afford. Now, the regulatory principles that we had are mainly competition oriented, and that's a big discussion today. How does how does sort of potential anti-competitive behavior play into a lot of connectivity and other interrelated e-commerce issues. Uh, but they are also a collection of best practice of regulators in terms of impartiality was incredibly important, which is one of the services agreements uh, principles itself. But I think that the community of telecom who came together realized in it was going to be a major issue, impartiality in the telecom sector because of the difficulty of reforms. Again, that wasn't a north-south issue. I remember very early in the first regulator set up by Germany, there was a head regulator who resigned because he felt the ministry was pressuring him to give preferential treatment to Deutsche Telekom. So this was something everyone was experiencing, and there was a commonality of views on what should be done. Um, not only were there price, price uh, differences, but there were services such as the gateway issues became something that I think is extremely important to telecom. And that's probably one of the residual areas that is still a problem today, um, because former monopolies in many cases still control gateways. And where they can, they try to preserve to the extent possible a monopoly pricing situation. And I think that has a major implication for Internet access. Um, and we'll probably be talking about that more. Uh, one of the things that comes into play in terms of uh, innovation and collaboration is encour encouraging competition. And I think the collaboration that still needs to take place, we're seeing through the prism at the WTO of electronic commerce discussions um, there's call for collaboration not only between trade people and telecom people, but trade people and financial people, trade people and cybersecurity people. And you're seeing that um, uh, the competition really is not going to be full-fledged unless people look towards how do you take an approach that is somewhat lighter-handed regulation, even though there's some very important things that need to be regulated for very important policy reasons. Um, the ecosystem for e-commerce, I must admit, I think most of us realize that telecommunications and internet is probably the foundation of that ecosystem, uh, but it's not the whole ecosystem. Therefore, uh, I know that um, Sophie's 
work has encouraged telecom regulators to take a much more interagency approach for regions like that. And finally, innovation. Let, let me just say that regulatory innovation, I think, there's an example from the WTO reference paper on telecom regulatory principles that at this point uh, over 100 governments have uh, signed on to it. As you say, it's actually they add it to their market access uh, commitments. Uh, when it was being discussed, it was very interesting because you had all these uh, ministry or regulatory authorities sitting around a table in the Japanese mission. And uh, they were discussing all the details of the kind of things that should be done to make sure the competitive environment is preserved. And uh, I used to say, well, you had the Americans pushing, you know, everything FCC does, and you had the Canadians pushing what uh, their regulator does, and you had the Europeans not sure what they were going to do because they hadn't opened up yet and didn't quite know exactly what regulatory framework they would have. And uh, But more and more specific kinds of recommended, recommended practices of regulators were being listed. It was getting longer. And then there was a regulator from Asia, and he said, listen, this is the way the game is played in Asia. As soon as we make a regulation, uh, the operators get busy with their lawyers and try to figure out what's the loophole that they can get around. Uh, so we constantly have to evolve regulation. And because of what he said, all these specific examples were then reduced, which gave Sophie and her people a lot of work to do. <laughs> and and it, the basic principles of regulatory good practice and competition safeguards uh, came to the fore which allowed for regulatory innovation. And I was happy to see that some developing countries would look at the Canadian example, look at the Australian example, and so on, and take pieces of it, because, but because we had very broad regulatory principles, they could meet them by doing something completely new. My most typical example is uh, Chile auctioning off universal service rights rather than doing the, what was sort of the accepted best practice at the time was um, universal service funding mechanisms. Um, so what I think that uh, I would like to see in the e-commerce space, which is where WTO is working now and what many of you people here this week will be thinking about, is coming up with a lot of collaboration between regulators and trade people and governments. I think the trade people have a few principles that everyone else should keep in mind, even though the trade people are not or never going to do your work for you, and um, that the, the, the principles be flexible enough that there can be a lot of innovation. Do I see exactly what is best practice, not only in the communications, but in other areas of the digital economy? I'm not sure I see a clear vision to best practice. So the innovation and collaboration is probably even more important today than it was in the time that we were negotiating uh, more on the basic telecommunications. Thank you so much. And for those of you that didn't live through some of this, and I, I, was, uh, I did a little bit <laughs> when I was in government years ago, this was so important to opening up just the broader collaboration that Lee is talking about. Mm -hmm. And I really, really love this uh, focus on the principles needed to be to be flexible enough from the regulatory side. And I, we, some of us have been regulators or worked with regulators and written laws or try to encourage them to change their practices to allow new innovative, say, local, local access networks in, community networks, or looking at USF, as you're saying, in a different way. It, it's hard for some regulators to change and policymakers midstream. So I guess the question is, what are those principles that we could look at down the road to allow in different um, players and actors and stakeholders so that you're formulating something that can be flexible enough? Um, there's no wrong answer, right? Or right answer, I suppose. <laughs> um, our next panelist is Torbjörn Fredriksson from the UNCTAD. And he's had a great success last week with an e-commerce week. He works closely with Lee and Sophie here in town. And we're very interested in working with him as well from the Internet Society's perspective and civil society to see what we can do to talk more about the broadening and allowing more e-commerce, opening some of the borders. And for landlocked developing countries and LDCs, Torbjörn has a great new study out, UNCTAD, Rapid E-Trade Readiness Assessment. So I'm going to turn it over to Torbjörn next. Thank you very much, Jane, and uh, good morning still to everyone. Yeah. 
Uh, as uh, many of you know, Anktad is one of the co-conveners of the WISIS Forum every year. And uh, in particular, we are quite active on the e-business front and uh, on the measuring of the uh, information society, information economy. So it's great to be back here in, uh, in ITU headquarters. Uh, but before perhaps going more into um, the substance of this one, I just wanted to um, express uh, my and, and Ankta's condolences with my ITU colleagues for the tragic loss of colleagues in the crash of Ethiopian airline flight. Um, one of those who were on board was Mr. Marcelino Tayob, who was working very closely with us. Uh, he, is, uh, he was based in ITU's regional office in Addis Ababa, and he was our main counterpart for, for example, when we organized the Africa e-commerce week as late as December last year. So we were all quite shocked about that and we feel, feel very sorry about that. And I just wanted to say because the first time I'm here after that happens. So. Um, Jane, you, uh, you mentioned that uh, we just had the e-commerce week last week here in Geneva. And uh, like the WISIS Forum, it is uh, an illustration of how we can work together. I think uh, the, the overall theme last, year, last week was uh, from digitalization to development. And we see that uh, this is becoming increasingly important that we, that we address in a smart way and in a collaborative way as uh, digitalization is now transforming basically everything that is being done, uh, both from an economic and a commerce perspective, but also, also how we communicate and interact in society. Um, and uh, we constantly, constantly need to remind ourselves that, that many people in the world are still not part of this process. So we have uh, still half of the world's population not using the internet. Uh, in the uh, least developed countries, it's only about 20% who are uh, using the internet. If we go to an area that we are more responsible for in Ankta, where we look uh, particularly at in the, with regard to e-commerce, here in, uh, in North, North Europe or uh, in, in the US or Japan or whatever, we have maybe between 60 and 80% of the people regularly buying things online. You go to the least developed countries of the world and maybe two, three percent of the population are buying things online so far. So we, we're dealing with extremely big divides still in the world here. Um, and I think uh, one of my overall uh, remarks for this session is to, to stress really that when we talk about connectivity and how to leverage that for economic development, we need to look not just at the supply side, but very much also at the demand side. Uh, we have um, uh, various examples of uh, countries where you have seen rapid growth in connectivity, uh, where, but this has not really translated yet into actual use and uh, commercial use. Uh, I'll just mention the, uh, the case of Rwanda here, which has been one of the really big success stories in terms of rolling out um, uh, mobile broadband, uh, which is basically covering uh, close to 100% of, of the population now. But according to ITU's latest data, only around 20% of the people are using the internet. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, uh, the World Bank's data on the share of the population that are buying things online, it's only 1%. So from having, in, in theory, 100% access, uh, only 1% of the population are using that kind of access for buying and selling online, or buying mainly online. So I think that's something we can keep in mind. Um, we, uh, in Anktad, uh, the part that I'm leading, uh, which relates to e-commerce and the digital economy, is still a rather small part of the whole Anktad. Uh, in contrast to uh, ITU, where 100% is ICT-related, uh, in Anktad, maybe 2% is ICT-related in that sense. Uh, and I think, um, uh, therefore, we feel that uh, the only way for us to have an impact on, on anything in this world related to digitalization is to have effective partnership. Uh, and it was against that background that we launched what we call the E-Trade for All initiative, which uh, was launched at our ministerial in 2016 uh, with the aim of helping uh, developing countries to find more easily assistance in seven policy areas, uh, one of which is related to connectivity and ICT infrastructure. Uh, when we launched it, we had 14 partners. Now we have 30 partners, 
And I'm really happy to note that uh, ISOC, ITU, and WTO are uh, fully involved in this, and uh, that uh, all of you uh, also took uh, the opportunity to, to have sessions during last week at the e-commerce week. In fact, 26 out of the 30 partners were actively involved in the e-commerce week, which I think illustrates the value that we all see in collaborating in this, this rather challenging domain. Um, we uh, believe that uh, in order for developing countries to have a chance to really keep up or ideally catch up with what's going on in the, in the digital world right now, we need to find much smarter ways of connecting the dots here. It's about not just working across the organizations, but we need to help developing countries also in finding smart ways to working across the ministries uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, stumbling blocks when we try to help developing countries to enhance their readiness to engage in e-commerce and uh, e-trade uh, is to start out by identifying who should take uh, the lead. Uh, is it the Minister of ICT? Is it the Minister of Trade? Is it the Minister of uh, Economy? Minister of Finance? These are problematic challenges for any country, but for uh, developing countries where much less experience has been had with regard to uh, e-commerce and e-trade and so on, then it's even more of a challenge. And sometimes when we get the question uh, from uh, diplomats here in Geneva, I was I remember speaking to the, uh, the ambassador of Afghanistan, and he said, okay, so based on your experience, which, can, which ministry should take the lead? And since I wasn't quite sure of what his affiliation was in capital, I tried to fudge it and say that, well, actually, I can't tell you that, but the, the more powerful the ministry, the better. And I think that's the, that's the key, because if you, if, you, if you don't have a powerful ministry taking the lead, it's very difficult for that ministry to get the other ministries on board. So I think that's a, a general uh, observation. Um, I, I, I think uh, later uh, in this session, I'll be happy to share some of the observations that we have uh, drawn from uh, what we call rapid e-trade readiness assessments that we have undertaken for least developed countries around the world where the connectivity aspect is one of these seven areas. Uh, and uh, as Jane was saying, we, have, uh, we had last, last week also a two-day uh, session with the, all the focal points of these least developed countries here in Geneva and where we sat down to see it's one thing to come up with these kind of uh, reports and the recommendations and so on, but ultimately it's a question of how do you turn those recommendations into actions on the ground. And here we need simply to do a better job. Um, the digital divides that we have uh, noted, the fast growth of the uh, digital economy and e-commerce, we just between uh, 2016 and 17, the global uh, um, e-commerce market grew from 26 trillion to 29 trillion. So it's, it's growing very, very fast. And the fact that you have these multiple policy areas that basically need to be addressed in parallel, uh, we need to find smarter ways to give assistance to the developing countries, especially the, uh, the least developed countries one. Uh, and uh, here, just to bring in this dimension to the debate before, we, uh, before I close, uh, the current levels of support, development assistance, to this part of uh, development is far too small. Uh, the latest numbers from uh, OECD and WTO on aid for trade, for example, show that only between 1 and 2 percent of all aid for trade funding goes into the ICT area. And the Web Foundation came out about a year ago with a report where they also concluded that among all the multilateral development banks, only 1% is devoted to uh, ICT infrastructure. And out of that 1%, only 4% is related to policy and regulatory issues, which is one of the most important areas to make progress in. So I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for those of you that are, are new to some of the people sitting here, um, there's a reason we, we wanted to uh, showcase what they're doing, is that they listen. They actually know people in countries, go to those countries, speak other languages, have written laws, worked with them on trade, opening markets, but also the solutions that regulators and policymakers might need, and innovation, as we were talking about moving forward. So it's not because they are here in Geneva alone. 
Valeria and I and Sophie, Lee, Torburn, we've all been out in the field and worked in the field, spent many years trying to see and listen to what the problems are from others. Mm -hmm. And so that's a critical factor in, in being effective and not trying to go in and say, we know better than you do, because we don't. Mm -hmm. um, we have to, but we have tools and we have resources. And to your point, if only 1% mm -hmm. of the aid for trade funding, mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's mind boggling. It is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. um, we'll next turn to Sophie Maddens, who's here at the ITU. I'll let Sophie uh, introduce herself, but she's a, a colleague of many years and uh, is one of the key people here that's done the, the field to Geneva. Everyone here has. Thank you very much, Jane, and thank you, Torpion and Lee, for your great presentations. And indeed, um, I think one of the things, one of the reasons, and if I think about 20 years ago when I first, or 30 years ago, when I would first go out into the field, ICTs were seen as a luxury. Yeah. And so we were often blown from the table. Mm -hmm. um, today that has changed because ICTs are really seen as the oil for economic and social development. But, we, uh, but one of the things I think we need to get better at is putting the human impact story on our work. Even within, with my colleagues, uh, talking about regulatory and policy, and they ask me, what's the human impact? Because you see our, our colleagues dealing with networks, our colleagues dealing with cybersecurity, they come up with these emergency telecommunications, they come up with these wonderful impact stories. But I, I think policy and regulatory measures really do have that human impact. And so in, that, in this presentation, I want to cover the challenges and opportunities for inclusive connectivity, the first mile, the middle mile, the last mile, and across the borders. And how do we really reach that affordability? Because we hear about connectivity, but it needs to be affordable connectivity. It needs to be available connectivity. And then also, how do we really use that connectivity, how do you get it, how do you trust it, how do you use it, so that we can bring the unconnected into the digital economy so that they can benefit from the advantages of the digital transformation. And yes, Jorbjorn, we really do need to work together to look at the demand side and supply side, make sure we address trust in ICTs and think out of the box about how we can partner and how we can find innovative financing and innovative regulatory solutions to, uh, to address the policy and regulatory frameworks and the financing and the partnerships. ITU is the lead, lead facilitator on Action Line C6, the enabling environment. And in fact, we'll have our C6 Action Line facilitators meeting this afternoon at 2.30. And I'll be talking more about collaborative regulatory mechanisms in that particular session. Um, but collaboration is key. Um, and collaboration between stakeholders, collaboration across the sectors, as you said as well, Torm Bjorn. We need to decide who should take the lead and also how we can work together to benefit. Um, if you look at, for example, at, for example, at digital financial inclusion, it's not just about bringing connectivity to unserved and underserved areas so that people can actually receive money on mobile wallets, go and cash them out at the first cash merchant, and go and live their life as usual. It's really about teaching and about teaching and understanding mm -hmm. What is digital financial inclusion? How can these financial services now be used to uh, benefit the applications, e-health, e-agriculture, e-education? So I'll talk a bit about the digital transformation, then go to elements for regulators and policymakers to consider how to respond, how, and how can we foster an environment where people can have access, trust, and use uh, these ICTs all people, including people with disabilities. I think all of you, like me, have your head spinning right now because there's so many initiatives out there right now. We have the Moonshot for Africa. We have the Digital Economy, Economy Task Force. We have the Digital Cooperational Panel. We have the Digital Finance Task Force. So there's a lot of initiatives out there. I think it's because we have realized that we have to have an open and frank discussion and a wide discussion in which we bring the value, various elements and we learn about each other's strengths. We learn about what each of us can bring to the table and how we can foster those partnerships to really take another step forward. Next slide, please. So what is, uh, what is, this, um, what is the background here at ITU? In 2017, we declared that universally accessible 
secure and affordable telecoms ICTs are a fundamental contribution towards the achievement of the WSIS action lines and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I'm reading this because this is text that really sets out our mandate. It sets out what we achieve to do. And we, and again, policymakers and regulators should continue to promote widespread affordable access, including internet access, through fair, transparent, stable, predictable, non-discriminatory, enabling policies, and legal and regulatory environment. You can see that there were a lot of lawyers in the room because there were a lot of words in there. But for us, it really is, it, 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 in a way, it has given us a path forward. Um, it has given us a path forward because there are some key words there. Transparency, mm -hmm. Jane was talking about collaboration, collaboration across the stakeholders. We need to talk and we need to have an open and frank discussion about how can we use the platforms that exist and how can we use the tools we have to go further. It talks about predictable because at the end of the day, investors want predictability but we also talk about innovation. So how do you balance that predictability that gives that confidence to investors with stability, with also that innovation so that new ideas and new mechanisms and new solutions, community networks is one of them. But you can also look at licensing, licensing mm -hmm. processes that can build in innovation in that licensing. And going back to 1999, Antonio Guterres was then the prime minister of Portugal. He was from the Socialist Party. Portugal, in the end of the 1980s, still had 15 years waiting lists at the other side of the river, river of the capital for a fixed line. Then Portugal leapfrogged into the information society. They were presiding the E-Europe initiative. There was all talk about ICTs and the E-Europe and everything like that. In Germany and the UK, you had these massive auctions that brought in huge amounts of money. We're going back to Portugal that was basically rural agricultural country coming out of very trying times, coming out where they still needed ICTs to help their country develop. They didn't go for the auction, they went for a beauty parade, which was a choice that fit that administrative and cultural context at that time. And in the beauty parade, they put 50% of the evaluation criteria on innovative information society projects using 3G. So I'm saying there are a lot of mechanism, a lot of tools, policy and regulatory tools. And you've heard that term here, and you were saying to me a while ago, I sound like a broken record. Now, <laughs> Lee can tell me that as well, because I came with this story in 1999 to the WTO. So there are tools. Don't mm. always try and reinvent the wheel, but try and balance that transparency, mm. that predictability, mm. the stable, but also the innovation and innovation in the tools you have. So if we go to the next slide, this is where we stand today. So we have 50% of the world's population connected, but don't forget what I said. How do you get it? How do you use it? How do you trust it? So as they, my, the previous speakers were saying, inclusive connectivity is not just about bringing the wires. Inclusive mm -hmm. connectivity is also thinking about the skills, is also thinking about mm -hmm. the trust, is also thinking about now how can we use this connectivity to foster a better use of all the great applications that are out there so that we really can show and that the impact, the human impact is real. And we have so many examples of that today. So if we go to the next slide, one of the examples, the impact of broadband digitization and regulation, ITU has brought out a global study. We're bringing out regional studies on the impact of broadband digitization and regulation. And I see that my colleague has left the room, Yulia Lozanova has been working on that. And we really have built on a study we had din done on the impact of broadband on economies of 2012 and brought in a lot of valuable data. And that's another point I want to make. Mm -hmm evidence-based decision-making, regulation by data. Today, with big data and with emergent technologies, we have an enormous access to data across the institutions, across the communities, and that data can help us bring in these innovative solutions. So here are some, I, I urge you and I will invite you to come and look at those reports so that you can see, and they have the formula in there, so the economists out there, I'm sure there's economists in the room, they'll love this report. I'm a lawyer, I, I understand about one-tenth of it, but it's okay. We need to work together. 
we need to, the different skill sets as well to be able to be innovative, think out of the box, and come up with these solutions, these regulatory, these policy solutions, so as to achieve that digital transformation and bring those billions of unconnected into the digital economy. What are the trends? There are these new technologies, the new players, the new business models, oops, the OTTs, the OSPs, <laughs> the community <laughs> networks, the municipalities. We have all these new players coming into the ecosystem, and that's good. Do we need, does that give us more headaches and work as regulators? Maybe. Does that give us more opportunities? Definitely. Mm -hmm. But again, through that frank, open discussion and putting the cards on the table and together trying to find these solutions, I think that way we can really achieve the breakthroughs. There's no doubt that we need that affordable capacity, that we need speed. We need, so that we need to look at the broadband trends. We need to look at the first mile, middle mile, last mile. What, there's been a huge growth in submarine cables. Is that capacity going to the people? Affordable way? Mm -hmm. Not yet. So again, there we need to see what policy mm -hmm. and regulatory measures can we use and leverage to bring all those investments into serving the people we want to serve. Then also the intersection of the ICT sector with other sectors, that collaborative regulatory mechanisms. We need to think about that. Who's in charge? I've been working for the last two years on digital financial inclusion, and I can tell you I've almost been unwelcome in certain <laughs> meetings with central banks where they said, why are you here? What are your KPIs? And I say, actually, more ambitious than yours, because we want to connect the world. Mm -hmm. And through, by connecting the world, you can now achieve digital financial inclusion, because you, central bank, you think you're in charge of, di of financial services. If the network goes down and the money goes poof, who do you call? Our people. Exactly. So we really need to work together. We need to think about quality of service, quality of experience, interoperability, consumer protection, and work together in that Venn diagram. Mm. So if we look at inclusive connectivity, Jane, human infrastructure, technical favorite. infrastructure, <laughs> governance infrastructure. I worked with Jane a while ago for many, many years, but we actually worked in the same company five years ago. And that's what we kept on saying, human infrastructure, technical infrastructure, governance infrastructure. And by the way, it's in the World Bank world <laughs> moonshot documentation as well. They talk about digital infrastructure, digital frameworks, digital skills. This is just a wish list or a list of things that we're looking at, a toolbox with issues to consider so that we can achieve that inclusive connectivity. I've put here some, if you just, because it's one of those, no, go back, go back, go forward, but just click again. No, go forward. No, no, other way, other way. And get, it, get the words to come on. There you go. Again, this is just some ideas. Where do we see the role of government, regulator, and industry? Civil society, I apologize, That's Jane, right. but <laughs> industry slash civil society. And again, we each have our role and mandate. Mm -hmm. And one of the core starting points when you're talking about policy and regulation, when I've written laws in countries, I always say, what's your vision? And think of the Apollo program. Think of John F. Kennedy. I want to send a man to the moon. We want ICTs to have human impact. What do we need to do to achieve that? What are the programs we need to build? And what are the tools that are there? But for that vision, you as regulators need to make sure that your mandate is clearly defined. It's not just about setting up a regulator or a department in the ministry, but you need to have a clear mandate mm -hmm. in which you can do your work, in which you can have your resources, and in which you can reach out across the sectors and within the sectors. So I just want to touch upon something, because when we talk about uh, inclusive connectivity, we always get to the end game, which is, I have a universal service fund. I can do this. Mm -mm. Universal service funds, the financing, mm. we need to think of the various tools in which we can reach that inclusive connectivity. It's that institutional framework, it's the vision, it's the regulatory tools, it's the partnerships and the financing models. Let's think of all of that, and USFs might be part of that, but we've seen too many countries that have assumed that by setting up a USF they will reach inclusive connectivity. Mm. Wrong. Mm. 
And last but not least, here's my broken record, Torben. <laughs> we have our Global Symposium for Regulators, which is our unique, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is our unique flagship event. It is a gathering of regulators that takes place every year. And this year will be in Vanuatu from the 9th of the, to the 12th of July in which we will be talking about this inclusive connectivity and the future of regulation. I welcome you all there because GSR is really a platform mm -hmm. where we can talk, we can share, we can discuss, we can come up with solutions, including the best practice guidelines that regulators adopt every year at the Global Symposium for Regulators. And very last but not least, if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to us. Here's my email address. I'm not the know-all, but we can put you in touch with colleagues across the sectors, across the agencies, with civil society, with industry, and with an ITU as well. So thank awesome. you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. And I wanted to highlight a point that you were making about transparency and collaboration. Uh, there's a predictability that regulators and investors do want. But there's also innovation that's needed to help connect people at that last mile or the middle mile where some of the solutions and the return on investment just isn't there for some of the bigger operators right now. And we're seeing ways that you, we can meet in the middle with community networks who are sort of the first mile out of the villages or the, the communities working with government to find a different way forward. Is there a way that you can look at an innovative licensing regime? Mexico is one of the first countries to look at social purpose licensing in indigenous communities. They have an innovative way forward where they have licensed, allowed, and expanded connectivity through um, something called community networks. Project uh, in Oaxaca, Mexico. Rizomatica is one of their partners. Um, Valeria is here from the Association for Progressive Communications, um, a key member and colleague of, well, key civil society organization. She'll tell you more about it. But with ISOC and the Internet Technical Community and the Civil Society Interface, with Valeria and her team working on inclusive connectivity solutions, we're looking at ways we can bridge across these partnerships, how to create that connectivity in the underserved and the unserved. As Lee was saying, there's some places that just don't have connectivity. There was a village in South Africa that one of Valeria's colleagues um, has been working with for the last seven years. And we were there in August. It was amazing. Sebastian is my colleague here who runs our community network project. He's been working with teams all over the world from the Internet Society to APC to try and find ways that we can help spark this conversation, look at funding. Universal service, in my mind, in some countries is broken. Sorry to say that. Um, the funds sit there, as Sophie said, just because you have a universal service fund doesn't mean that you've, you've met that obligation. You've got to figure out innovative ways to put that money out into the field. So, Valeria, over to you. Thank you, Train and Isaac, for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here and share some reflections with you based on the work that we have been doing, in, particularly in the last couple of, of years. Well, my name is Valeria Betancura. I'm from Ecuador. And um, um, uh, in the APC, we are working mostly in the Global South uh, for people to have easy and affordable access to a free, free and open internet to improve people's lives. And um, in, in, the, in the field of access, I think it is wide, widely agreed that uh, without connectivity, individuals and communities face significant barriers to not only participate in economic and social life, but actually um, face barriers to really be benefited by but all that a, a digital economy could bring to their lives. So universalizing access and connectivity has therefore become a key policy priority in many countries. And, it, and as, as you know, and it has been pointed out, it is a, one of the core pillars uh, of the UN Sustainable Development um, Agenda. Uh, however, there is increasing concern over across the board uh, about the uh, slowdown in the growth uh, of voice and internet uh, users, whether you look at the mobile subscribers or internet penetration. So uh, we, have found, we have found out that commercial networks deployed by national operators are now only expected to connect from 60 to 70 percent of the population of the world by 2025, which indicates that the UN Sustainable Development Goals that an anticipate attaining universal connectivity by uh, 2030 uh, perhaps will not be achieved uh, if we continue at this pace. 
so despite of the decades of deployment using, using the current strategies, it appears increasingly difficult to address not only the needs of the billion of people that uh, are in developing countries are, are still not connected and suffer for ineffective communication services, mostly because of coverage and also affordability limitations. Those, those are the two main aspects that we have found are still inhibiting people to be benefited by digital communications. Uh, and however recent technology advances have been uh, made network equipment more accessible and affordable and easy, easier to deploy, um, it is uh, important to realize that there are still critical barriers. However, uh, this type of small scale networks that are emerging all around the world are providing some locally owned um, solutions for people to address the connectivity, the connectivity challenges. So many our, of our members' organizations in the APC across the world have become very active uh, in supporting this type of alternative networks that we call them community networks, as many of you know. Uh, and it has, it, it has been a trend that has a strong parallels with what the APC was doing 30 years ago uh, in, in trying to respond to similar needs of building local internet infrastructure, but also developing uh, skills at community levels to um, bring the benefits of in, in 30 years ago, that new technology to people. And currently, most governments are still a little bit um, uh, not, not completely aware of the potential impact of, of these independent, small-scale community-based networks. And as a result, these networks are, are still relatively scarce because regulatory environments, as Sophie was pointing out, are not conducive to them. So aside from the lack of uh, enabling environments uh, at the regulatory um, uh, area, uh, com community networks, particularly those in the ro rural global south, face many other difficulties. Not only financial resources for their initial deployment are often very, very limited, uh, and, but few people in these communities also have, don't have the necessary technical and management skills to actually deploy, sustain, make these networks grow. Um, uh, so today I, I would like to just bring uh, two, main, main, two aspects that we have found, particularly in the, wor in the work that we have been doing in the, last two year, in the last two years. Some of them are the main characteristics that the policy and regulatory environments should have in order to enable the deployment of strengthening of community networks. And the second is some of, some of the benefits of community networks. And this work, as I have been mentioning, um, are in part a result of projects that we have been developing together with, in partnership with Rizomatica, uh, also supported by, AXA, by, by ISOC, the International Development Research Center, uh, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, Mozilla, among others. And it is important to mention that the, the work that um, I'm going to talk about has been led by a group of experts, including Carlos Rey Moreno, Kathleen Diga, Steve Song, Peter Bloom, among others. And um, I, I would like to also talk to you, and I will do, I will present research findings that uh, have, been, have been led by Professor Nicola Bidwell and Mike Jensen. Uh, this kind of exploratory research, research work that we have been doing around, around trying to understand how viable these infrastructure models or viable alternat alternatives to connect the unconnected are, and also what are the circumstances that make them successful on one hand. And on the other, other hand, we have been also trying to understand what are the additional benefits to the local communities in terms of well-being, in terms of gender equity, in terms of social and economic development that these local connectivity solutions can bring to, to people. So what we have found so far is that even though the growth of mass market manufacturing and an array of technology innovations make it possible for local uh, communities and groups to develop innovative affordable and sustainable solutions to their own access challenges, it is not always understood that policies, particularly policies and regulations for telecommunication have, have historically 
being designed for large scale for profit corporations. And that's something to, that we have to keep uh, uh, in mind because that's something that has to change if we want to encourage the these, uh, these uh, alternative um, networks to flourish. So most of the initiatives we have studied in Africa, in Latin America, and Asia have been at a disadvantage in building and providing connectivity because national policy environments have been not conducive to these networks. This is especially the case for providing voice services. Access to sufficient radio spectrum is insufficient. Licensing or interconnection requirements and fees are not adjusted for small operators, which creates relatively um, higher burdens to them, especially if they have also not been able to access to state support uh, given to national operators for extending the networks uh, and into unprofitable areas. So as a result, most of the networks have been largely confined to using unlicensed spectrum and are dependent of limited sources of funding in the startup phase, but also for expansion. So these networks are those um, slower to grow or replicate, and their overheads are higher than they would, uh, would otherwise have been. Um, what is missing then are enabling regulations to unleash the potential of these community networks and other small operators to deliver affordable access everywhere. It is inter interesting to mention that some countries like Mexico, Argentina, South Africa have, um, have begun to recognize and empower local ser service providers. And this is very in line with um, ITUD recommendation 19 that um, talks about the important to consider small and non-profit community operators through um, regulatory measures, and also talks about the need for radio spectrum planning, licensing activities to consider mechanisms to facilitate the deployment of broadband services in rural and remote areas by small and non-profit community operators. So um, among the interventions needed at the, at the level of the regulatory and policy environment that could help to unleash the potential of these initiatives, let me mention a few. So licensing, licensing is very uh, important to um, understand that most developing countries do not have technologically neutral, simple, and affordable authorizations to permit service provision. Uh, so national licenses are often the only type available, uh, and this can impose serious bureaucratic and also financial burden to new actors. So it is necessary to create the license exceptions, provisions, or lessen the administrative burden for small, op small operators or non-profit uh, <coughs> uh, actors interested in providing affordable access in areas that are not yet served by the market. The other one is access to radio spectrum. Um, as you know, most licensed spectrum is also allocated nationally. And this means that by default, um, small scale operators are excluded from access to the radio spectrum required for mobile voice and also for data services. So it is important to know that um, much of the mobile spectrum assigned to national operators is still unused. Uh, in rural areas. So this suggests that the, there is an opportunity for innovative approaches to reuse the spectrum and to, to provide affordable access for all. Is therefore, is therefore very important uh, to provide a special spectrum allocations, either primary assignment or allowing secondary use of the one that is idle. Uh, to those interested in, interested in serving in rural areas or in remote populations where people are not connected. So the other aspect, uh, aspect is access to passive infrastructure and backhaul. So even with license and access to a spectrum, it is often impossible to provide affordable access in rural areas if there are no domestic backbones or to provide backhaul connections, or if backhaul is not affordable. So aside from, limited, um, aside from limited competition in this area, this is also often because infrastructure sharing and dig one policies are not in place to minimize the cost and incent incentivize private operators to roll out, to roll out um, fiber infrastructure. So promoting and enforcing clear guidelines and transparent pricing models 
for infrastructure sharing could really contribute to, the, to this end. Um, the, the other aspect that we have, have found out that is crucial is access to network information. Because even if fiber is available uh, nearby, it is often very difficult for a new operator to know where the, where the nearest point of presence is. So it can design and cost the network accordingly. So it is also difficult to know who owns allocated radio frequencies that might be unoccupied or unused in rural areas. Similarly, access to information on tower locations is needed so both governments and other actors can identify the connectivity gaps and adopt best approach to close them. So even though there is a massive amount of data available across, across various institutions, as, um, as some other speakers pointed out, it is still crucial to promote open data strategies to make this information pu public and open. So it will enable the stakeholders to participate in looking for solutions to close the digital divide. And then the last one that I want to mention um, is taxes associated with service provisions. Because there are many taxes that add uh, to the burden of a starting and operating network. So in some countries, import taxes, for instance, are up to 40% of the total cost of the equipment. Other taxes include um, fee per mast and devices installed and contributions to universal service funds, um, among others. So these added costs um, must be recovered from end users and which further limits the, the service affordability. So it is very important to consider special tax breaks or deductions for small operators providing affordable access in rural and remote areas. And just to finalize in relation to the benefits of community networks, um, uh, I would like to touch upon some of, the, some of what appears to be some of the important benefits and advantages of community networks over traditional la large-scale commercial solutions. So af aside from the we very well-documented benefits of access to voice and internet service that connectivity usual, usually offers to rural communities in the Global South, the social impact research that we have been doing show that community networks have many other very specific benefits that are, let me mention this, very specific to this a new paradigm of community networks. So wider affordability of communications, direct savings made on the cost of existing communications, the role of community networks in the local circulation of money are clear and visible benefits. However, it is important to observe that while financial benefits are important for for people in low income community networks, there are no there are by no means um, the aspects that they value the most. And some of the, these other aspects includes issues such as the fact that community networks evolve in their specific contexts of use and adapt to local constraints, to local um, specificities in terms, in terms of the social economic needs and development needs of these communities. Also, uh, these community networks, we have found that they expose some of the hidden ways in, uh, in which uh, telecommunications usually exclude to the most disadvantaged people in society and amplify inequalities. So the incentive for community networks to address factors that contribute to exclusion is far greater than commercial telecommunications. So this is one of the issues that we would like to emphasize. Also, community networks expose the many ways that um, telecommunications regulation and policies and technical infrastructures perpetuate gender inequalities and offer a wide range of important opportunities to represent the needs and interest of women in law and also in technology development. So people involved in communities, networks demonstrate considerable motivation and willingness to learn to change organizationally, organizationally, organizationally and operationally. So um, uh, those are some of the aspects that we feel uh, made these um, initiatives viable and also uh, stimulate and enable new creative social um, solutions that are more effective, effective for rural settings. 
and these different creative practical ways that community networks identify to address factors contributing to local exclusion are valuable lessons for many stakeholders uh, interested in serving, serving these populations, including commercial providers. So just to finish, uh, let me just emphasize that um, policies and regulations obviously must be modified to eliminate the barriers to entry to the entry for small operators. And second, there is no doubt that if based on traditional structure, community networks can replicate structural divides and exclusion. How, however, these community networks paradigm have much more potential to fix those exclusions and result in various types of practical, economic, social, and cultural benefits for people at community level. So thank you, Jane. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Valeria. Um, there's a lot that the community networks are doing, um, but it's got to be a partnership with various actors. Um, as Valeria was saying, uh, when you're working with a policy maker or a regulator, sometimes they're a little um, hesitant to take a look at allowing a new local access solution to come into being. Um, when it comes to those barriers for all of us in deploying infrastructure, um, Torbjorn, I wanted to ask you, um, from the trade perspective and working with LDCs and from the e-commerce perspective, um, and Lee, we were talking about gateways earlier. By gateways, we mean not only submarine cable landing stations, we can mean gateways between countries. There's still a cross-border connectivity challenge, yes? Community networks can help with some of that, or local access networks, or regulation and loosening. But Torbjorn, what are some of the key things that you've been seeing as some of the barriers that you've asked uh, or come up with solutions for eliminating or ways to provide that better connectivity from the ICT side for allowing better commerce and trade. Um, thank you, Jane. Uh, well, I mean, this was the, the, the key challenge here is, again, the, the, the multiplicity of issues that, uh, that you need to address to get this to work. If you look at the, the current situation in, in Africa, for example, the biggest e-commerce player that deals with goods, uh, Jumia. Yeah. They are active now, I think, in about 14 African countries. But basically, in every country, they need to run it as a national website. So it's very difficult to get the cross-border uh, e-commerce opportunities to be exploited. Uh, and for them, uh, uh, I do not think that the main problem is connectivity. They, they are mainly uh, placed in, in urban areas, in, in the most... Uh, um, promising parts of Africa, so th it's not an ICD issue, it's more a trade issue. Uh, it's a question of uh, overcoming the bottlenecks at the border, mm. uh, uh, overcoming the challenges in payments, where, of course, digital solutions can, can play an important role. Mm. Uh, it's about um, uh, the issues r related to regulations of, uh, for instance, data protection, consumer protection, which is not really uh, in place in most parts of, of Africa. Um, so, so it's a mixed, mixed bag. Uh, but there are, of course, still uh, important uh, challenges, as we all know, and that we're talking about, especially in this session, related to connectivity. Uh, and l let me perhaps um, highlight a few of the ones that uh, came out of our uh, assessments of African LDCs. We had uh, like uh, three lessons and uh, uh, four uh, key recommendations that uh, relate specifically to the to the connectivity area. And of course, most of this has already been highlighted, but it, but it could be useful perhaps to see that uh, the same kind of messages are emerging when you go specifically into the least developed countries then. So the first uh, lesson was that, uh, yes, ICT investments are increasing in these countries, but the biggest challenge is really related to broadband connectivity. Um, and um, uh, in fact, while uh, the use of the internet is increasing because of the um, slow pace at which uh, uh, broadband is, is growing, uh, the disparities in internet access and actual internet use is actually widening right now in, in many parts. Um, and uh, also, with less than 30% of Africans in LDCs having access to electricity, you know, that's a very fundamental issue. The use of ICT equipment and infrastructure uh, is still challenging, and the gap in connectivity between urban and rural especially. So it, it goes back to the connectivity uh, in the rural areas. And this divide is then 
in addition exacerbated by the low literacy level in, in, uh, in this area. Uh, of course, another very strong observation is that um, it's very mobile only. Uh, it, that is, the mobile is the, the promise, but at the same time, as was stressed, uh, it's important for these countries to also keep building on the fiber networks. Uh, so we, we should not think that everything is solved by having access to a smartphone. Uh, and then the, the cost implications is, is crucially important also to overcome. And, and I think that is um, uh, maybe not so much uh, first and foremost an issue for the cross-border, but just to get e-commerce going in the domestic economy and, and also to use that as a tool to bridge domestic, uh, rural and urban areas. Uh, other uh, in terms of recommendations, it's mainly stressing the infrastructure sharing, uh, increased uh, reliance on public-private partnerships as a way to share risks, um, to um, uh, s not forget the, the international bandwidth aspect. Uh, with expanding populations, more people accessing the internet, countries need to continue to invest in fiber optics, submarine cables, as well as satellite links. Uh, and finally, uh, which has also been mentioned, mesh, uh, mentioned uh, is the question of quality of service. Uh, it's not just having access or not. What kind of access, how, how reliable it, is it, and what kind of uh, downtime, downtime and uh, what kind of latencies are you faced with. So I think it, this whole spectrum is, uh, is appearing throughout this, uh, this assessment. Which goes back to a point you made earlier, too, about the ministries talking to each other, the different disciplines working together. That can often be difficult. Um, um, and your, your infrastructure sharing uh, point, we had um, a call from a colleague uh, in a community network in um, South Africa. And he called us to say, Jane, we need, we need some money. And I said, well, we're not the bank of the internet. What do you need this money for? And he said, we need $2,500 for a mast or a tower for a mesh network. And I said, okay, we gave you a grant before. Why do you need 2500 more? And he said, it was Carlos. <laughs> and a, a colleague from Senzaleni, the one of the, the networks in uh, South Africa. And he said, they want to charge us $2,500 a month to share the tower nearby one of the bigger operators, and we said 2500 a month versus 2500 for the tower. Do the math. I'm not, a ma I'm not an economist, but I can do this pretty fast. <laughs> there is the cost-benefit analysis, buy your own tower, put up your, the smaller network. What they did, and this is something that comes up all the time from economists and from others who say, oh, these little networks, they won't scale, and gosh, you know, do, are they viable? With that mast, they were able to create a wireless internet service provider and provide service to a bank. The funds that they receive on the monthly payments from the bank for the service provision goes into the fund to help with a nonprofit that provides service to a community that didn't have it before. The same as schools are being, um, the kids in the schools have access now. The other interesting thing is there's charging, uh, electrical charging from the tower, and they use solar panels for some of it. Others are off the grid. But it was an interesting uh, point he was making uh, that if the rules and regulations are so difficult and make it complicated for the local access networks to exist, those populations still aren't getting served well, and to your point, with better connectivity at speeds where you could actually do business. Um, so it does take this ecosystem of different actors coming together. Um, could I ask you? Community networks are fairly, they're not as new, but we've been working very hard with people, uh, with colleagues like APC and the, their communities of interest, um, with regulators like at CITEL in Latin America, um, policymakers, innovators who are in Argentina who are looking at new ways to allow a new 4G uh, bottom-up community network in a beautiful part of Patagonia that my colleague Christian was in a couple weeks ago. <laughs> um, what is it that we as the technical community and with civil society, what can we do to work with you, all of your organizations? I'm going to go down the line here. Um, because some people see us as upstarts. Those are those people that work in the, the small networks. Like, what is it that we can do to bridge that gap of discussion so that we can help you do what you need to do and we can take advantage of some of your best practices with what you're doing? Well, thanks. It I think it's a it's a it's a question of uh, you know looking where we have our our respective uh, 
strong points and how we can reinforce each other's works. Because uh, um, I, I was um, sitting together with a group of uh, experts from Liberia when we were doing the assessment of Liberia. And they were asking me, so, you know, we have still such great uh, community, uh, sorry, uh, connectivity challenges here. And this kind came from the telecom regulator, so that could also explain why he was asking this. He said, why don't we first make sure that we have good infrastructure, and then we can start talking about all the other factors that has an impact on e-commerce. That made sense to him. But I said, you know, the problem with doing that is that once you have your infrastructure, you don't have any demand for it. And, and then the infrastructure will not be very effectively used. It'll be very expensive to use because there are few users and so on and so forth. So the challenge here of working in parallel with all these issues is that for us to be effective at uh, helping countries improve their e-commerce performance, we need to partner with people like ISOC, with uh, the regional banks and with ITU that have expertise specifically in the connectivity issues. Uh, but, you know, somehow you, it does boil down to money. Yeah. Uh, you cannot escape that. It's great to have all these initiatives, and I think uh, the World Bank's moonshot, uh, we had the uh, Butena Germazzi Germaz speaking last week uh, here in Geneva, uh, who is the digital development director of the World Bank, and uh, I understand that they have uh, put aside something like $25 billion for this initiative, which sounds great. But so far, the Moonshot Initiative is still only available on paper. Uh, and I think when we see all these digital economy task force, the high-level panel on digital cooperation, so far, it's talk. So we need to make sure that we also get the, the, uh, the capital into the picture so that the, the various initiatives that are available, including in our own areas, can be scaled. Mm -hmm. We are quite proud to have done these 17 uh, uh, LDC assessments within two years. But that's not even half of the LDCs. And now we have a long list of non-LDCs that want to have this kind of assistance. They're coming and to me and yeah. they don't do what you do. Exactly. So, so, and once we get the, the recommendations coming out of this, they are eager to get the help to implement them. That's when we again need to work together. So uh, I think that in general, uh, that's what we need to work better together. And, and, and I think also focus on where we can reach so not everyone does exactly the same thing. So Lee, with the new negotiations that are coming up or some of what you've seen in the past uh, related to universal service or opening up a market, what are some of the key, key things that you think will be on the table moving forward or what can we do to help inform the process? Is there anything you need from sort of the field in that sense? To take it, I think, as Torbjorn is saying, we've all been saying, from talk to action because it's about operationalizing and trusting as Sophie said, the human trust networks, that's what I call them often we go into the field. Until you see us eye to eye, you don't know us, right? And if we're actually going to make progress, we need, you need to take a chance on us, whether it's UNCTAD or the WTO or the Internet Society and the technical community, APC with the technical work and the civil society and the ITU. How do we form those trust networks and what do we do to move forward with some of those negotiations? Or is there anything, what can we do? Well, that's a mouthful. Um, yes. One of, the, one of the sort of structural problems with WTO is this kind of collaboration is usually indirect. Yeah. Um, we expect that it should already be taking place in capital, you know, and that it comes here as a position that reflects both the large and the small players, both the domestic and the, you know, foreign participants in their economy, et cetera. And I, I must admit, let's say in the area where um, a generic problem it's first that everybody, whether industrialized or developing, is focusing on the big players and the big markets. And I, I've been listening to people talk about social impact assessments. What, what you get if you're focusing on big players and big markets, you're ignoring the fact that very small things happening in small markets that nobody's looking at can have a huge impact. I mean, you know, I have friends working in Senegal that, uh, that uh, Unfortunately, anecdotally, say that uh, making use of a very uh, uh, little mobile app has made the difference in a farmer being able to send his kids to school or not, and whether they eventually can go to university or not. And that's a huge impact that the economists and the lawyers and the policymakers tend to ignore. Um, we uh, have encouraged 
every time we go in the field to give seminars in capital that everybody comes, but you often tend to get you know, the, the, the uh, trade associations, maybe you get some SMEs represented by an e-commerce association if it exists. You don't really get things like community networks. Um, the direct way, the only direct way is to participate in WTO is if we know about you and we can bring you to WTO seminars or we can bring you in for the public forum and things like that. It made me think maybe we should do something on that. Because what I was hearing about community networks and their barriers are exactly some of the things we talk about in WTO. Are licenses too expensive? You know, is Spectrum, can you find out how Spectrum is being used? There's already some rules about that in the WTO. And, the, um, and you even gone to whether there should be opportunities for prior comment. There's a two or three initiatives we're looking for stakeholders nationally to have opportunities for prior comment on new regulations. And it's uh, something that on all these areas, I think it's a convenience for the big companies, but it's absolutely essential for the smaller companies that there be more impartiality and, and more transparency of governments. Because let's face it, the big companies have, have a stable of lawyers that can, can research this and figure it out, and the SMEs and things like community structures uh, don't. I think that um, just to not go on forever because I could, one of the other problems that is somewhat north-south, both have the problem, but I think it's even stronger in, in developing countries, is the idea that um, the fixed line operator in many countries, as, as little as it's doing in terms of overall penetration, still has an undue influence on government policy. You see that here where innovative services, the, the monopoly works, uh, former monopoly in many cases, works very hard to have these crushed because it's a threat to revenue, things that cost less. You know, the governments are encouraged uh, through pressure from the incumbent to to try not to let innovation happen, let especially things that are going to cost less than its own services. And that's, a, that's clearly at odds with connectivity. Um, but it's a very serious thing. I see a lot of this playing out in ITU, for example. I, I surely shouldn't say this, but things like how to, how to combat OTTs. Oh, come on. I mean, you know, uh, WhatsApp is not the enemy of, of the, the, the people. It's the friend of the people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Sophie, you have, um, through the ITU's development sector, you have regional offices everywhere. You've got an agenda that was set from the WTDC. You work with people around the world. What are some suggestions um, for creating that better uh, relationship among the stakeholders, especially perhaps with your GSR coming up? So I've heard some very interesting and combat OTTs. <laughs> <laughs> so we knew we shouldn't have said <laughs> We knew this was going to come up. No. <laughs> so combat OTTs, community networks, flexible spectrum. No. <laughs> I think it's we are in an age of digital transformation, and we are in an age where we have new players, where we have new solutions, where we have new approaches, mm -hmm. where we have collaboration amongst us, where we have collaboration across the sectors. And so there are the easier and the more difficult issues. But I think one of the things that I'm really proud of in the development sector is that we are in a platform where we can have these discussions. It's not to compare, it's to share experiences. And we have the study groups, we have the GSR, we have our reports, our best practice guidelines, in which everybody is welcome to come to the table. To give your example, look at, it, look at us today. Look at us today, and we know that we've touched upon issues that maybe aren't the most easy issues, mm. but we're having a discussion here. We're putting in mm. the different options. And we also have our colleagues in the regions who also are closer to the field, and they have these events. It's not simply events that we organize. We have capacity building, we have training, we have knowledge exchange. So look at us as a platform in which you can bring in your ideas and your suggestions so that maybe we can come to some solutions that maybe work for some countries and maybe not for others. Our guidelines are exactly that, guidelines. Our study groups, 
bring together its by membership for, me for membership. So <clears throat> to put in a few buzzwords here, embrace change. Think of that flexibility versus, versus invest or stability. Mm -hmm. Think of innovation versus in investment. The 5G discussion is all about huge amounts of, of investment, but it's also about the huge opportunities. Come here. I was at a training s seminar just a week ago in Nairobi with some countries that came out of and are still in very challenging circumstances. Mm -hmm. And they were the most wonderful kids that the regulator brought. And I call them kids because I turned to them and I said, how old are you? <laughs> and he turned to me and he said, 24. I said, oh, God, you're a year older than my own son. And they are now regulating. And they came to the table and they said, why are you bringing all this 5G? Because it's not relevant to us. And I said that to them the same thing. Listen. Listen. Because you might leapfrog through the regulatory, the policy and regulatory measures. There may be technologies that you might leapfrog into. So listen and learn and look at, so embrace change, embrace opportunities, embrace technologies, and get involved in the platforms and discussions. And there's a lot of out here. And as you can see, we cross fertilize each other. We talk to each other as well. So just get to know about it so that you look at the different options. Maybe community networks are not the solution for your country right now. Maybe it doesn't fit in your legal and administrative tradition right now. Maybe you have a universal service fund that actually works. Maybe you have satellite connectivity that is providing a solution to particular geographic circumstances. But if you don't know about all the solutions and bring them, don't just cut and paste. Bring them to your circumstances. Come to these fora. Ask, get to know your peers. Ask them questions. And so that way, you can find the solutions that will work for your countries. And it's not all set in stone. It might work for your countries today within a specific context. And maybe you want to continue being in those platforms so you learn about AI and how AI can be beneficial uh, within the context of big data, can the health applications. Maybe that's not, not right here, right now, but it maybe help you get to tomorrow and the opportunities that there are tomorrow faster. So that's just my two cents. <laughs> Embrace, get involved, and always that balance, flexibility, stability, innovation, investment, but always get involved in the discussion. Yeah, someone said, keep your ears open, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if you aren't as familiar with something. Um, Valeria, can I ask you to, to talk a little bit about the policy and regulatory training that um, you'll be doing in different regions, just to sort of a broad snapshot so that some colleagues in the room can hear about it, but also we may be able to integrate some of the best practices from some of the other organizations. Sure, absolutely. One of the, one of the aspects that we feel is absolutely necessary uh, I mean, towards the to, towards collaboration with other stakeholders is to work closely and build bridges with regulators. And um, uh, these regulatory trainings are opportunities for us not only to uh, try to unpack what the regulatory changes that we see are necessary in the community networks ecosystem to actually create an enabling environment for them, are but also are opportunities to precisely get together to build relationships, to find a ways to uh, establish synergies between what regulators see as their challenges, also working with different stakeholders, how they see their own context, and how we can come up with a kind of joint agenda for change. So um, these uh, trainings are going to happen along this year in Af Africa, um, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and at the moment, we are developing a specific materials to respond to the different regulatory traditions in, in the regions, which are a little bit different, even though there are some common challenges to, to, to all the regions. Uh, and, and, and some basic standard uh, aspects that we find, like, like the ones I talked about before, uh, in terms of licensing, in terms of you know taxes and so on, that can be actually applied in any context. So uh, we we expect to use these uh, as an opportunities to look at uh, them in more detail and also uh, assess feasibility 
uh, of how we can progressively advance some of these changes in a specific regulatory environment. So um, uh, I, I'm happy to share. We, we don't have the specific dates and locations so far, but I'm happy to be in touch and let you know about these opportunities for regulators to come and meet community networks, actors, and civil society organizations, academics working in this field, and make our way to these changes that we need to see in the regulatory environment. So we're seeing that some of the old principles and issues that were critical to opening up the markets, I think about the WTO's reference paper, which was licensing and transparency and spectrum. What am I forgetting? The competition, you know, and competition safeguards. safeguards. It's coming back. <laughs> um, and some, and Lee, you had, uh, when we were talking earlier, um, you had mentioned that some countries are, there's a fear of the internet and new technologies. Are you hearing this from some of the negotiations at the WTO? Well, I, I think I'm hearing it even more so because they're not well integrated into the co same community that understands IT mm -hmm. and looks at IT closely and, 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 and sees what to some degree what it's doing and, and what it may be capable of doing. So you tend to have these overreactions. And years ago when internet was first being existed, one of uh, a very few people I thought of as a mentor said, you know, uh, I talked to, they, they worked at an organization like ours and they said, I tell my members, uh, whenever you start overreacting to how to regulate something happening over the internet, pretend it was being done by the postal service. And then think about what you would do. And I think, again, that's probably uh, pretty close because it's very scary to people. And sometimes uh, it's more of a reaction to magnitudes of what can happen. And actually, that's part of the good part, <laughs> that more things can happen uh, than were happening. And more trade can take place. More communication can take place. So you do have this. And I think where it plays out in the WTO is um, perhaps uh, people not wanting to agree on regulatory principles because there's a huge gulf between people who might want to do what we might call over-regulate or people who, who say, well, let's do nothing because we don't know where things are going and there's a, everything in between. And that creates a difficulty in agreeing on a common set of basic principles in some degree. Um, we, in the reference paper, actually, it is a very strange bureaucratic passive wording. Shall be ensured this and that. Well, the reason for this passive wording was there were disagreements among people on how to implement. Mm -hmm. And if they could agree to the basic principles in some governments, it might be a competition regulator rather than a telecom regulator who deals with certain issues. In, in some governments, they wanted to have a um, uh, you know, very light-handed, you know, passive regulation always um, ex post, uh, wait till something happens, then deal with it. Some wanted ex ante. And we were able to agree on the principles, leaving aside the issue of you might have very different ways of getting there. Mm -hmm. So that helped a bit. I think that's what we're all saying is there are different ways of getting there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not a cookie. It's not, they mm -hmm. say it's not the same everywhere. Yeah. Every country's different. We find that from Latin America to Asia mm -hmm. to Africa when people say, well, what's the one solution? We said there's no one solution. There are principles, as you've all said, and best practices and things that we're all seeing. And Torbjorn, from, from last week, what were some of the key things that you took away from your, from your workshops um, that would lead to potential better understanding on the ICT for D side and the connectivity side? Uh, you know, we we started this uh, World Summit on the Information Side in 2003 and the second phase in 2005. <laughs> then by 2015, uh, David Souter helped the Commission on Science, Technology for Development to do a 10-year review, mm -hmm. I remember. And one of the striking things there was that uh, in the early um, writings about the WISIS, the mobile was hardly mentioned at all. Yeah. It was just about, you know, the internet uh, and, and what you call it, telecenters and all that thing, and the mobile was not there. And this was in 2015. We just go a few years now into 2019, and we have a completely different world again, mm. uh, and which was touched upon briefly in the review. But I think one of the challenges that we are facing now globally here is to deal with uh, with a very different type of uh, world uh, with the digital really going into everything it, we're not talking just a little bit of um, 
uh, a few new technologies that can be applied to solve uh, specific um, challenges uh, in the development world. It's very large-scale digital disruptions of uh, value chains, of how things are bought and sold, produced, disseminated, uh, and so on, and innovated. Uh, so I think uh, that is a bit of a uh, – creates a bit of a challenge for policymakers to deal with because we are all in this rather n new situation. So uh, many of the issues that are being discussed, for instance, the, the, the great importance of the digital platforms around the world now with a, a few companies uh, playing a particularly important role, the developed countries, they are – trying to figure out how does that uh, force us to look at competition policies, how does that force us to look at taxation policies. Uh, and uh, the same kind of challenges will uh, confront the developing countries, but perhaps at a slightly later stage. But it's important that they have a chance to participate in this dialogue right now so that not everything is a kind of fait accompli. Uh, just to, to highlight how rapid this change has been, um, in 2009 there were two, if I could call it, digital companies among the top ten of the world's uh, most valuable companies. That was Microsoft and IBM. As of 2018, eight out of the top ten were in the digital space. IBM was no longer among them. But uh, instead you had uh, uh, six uh, American firms and two Chinese firms. And four of them, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Tencent, and Alibaba, they were not even among the 100 largest firms 10 years earlier. And I mean, this means uh, an extremely rapid transition. Um, and uh, today, we, you know, you go back 10 years, there was also a very different digital landscape. Uh, today, Google accounts for uh, I think 92% of all the internet searches on the web. One company. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, a, a very uh, striking situation. So when we look at, it, just look at the biggest digital firms in the world, you see a very strong dominance of the US. You see a fairly strong position of China, supported with Japan and uh, Korea to some extent. And then Europe is very, very small. Uh, accounts for about 4% of the value of these uh, largest firms. And you go to Latin America and Africa, and if you just uh, sort of discount the uh, NASPERS ownership in Tencent, they, those two continents, account for 0.01% of the value of these. So it's a very, very different type of world here in, in, in this digital space. And this will be data and digital solutions will become so important in the future. Uh, and we are still talking here about um, half of the world not being, you know, online. Uh, so uh, I think this also uh, uh, should remind us that, that we need to perhaps think, we need to think about different challenges at the same time here. Uh, we had a meeting uh, between Wednesday and Friday last week, which was an intergovernmental group of experts on e-commerce and the digital economy, which was had decided for themselves to discuss the role and value of data in the digital economy. And we had 100 and, 100 and plus countries participating uh, in that discussion. But in the end, it was not possible to reach agreed policy recommendations on that because the perspectives are so diverse and the policy recommendations here are so diverse. And I think this is something that you feel very much also in the e-commerce discussions in, in the WTO, Lee. So uh, it's a big challenge here to, to come up with consensus on how to relate to this. And I think it's partly because uh, it's still very new to a lot of us. And, and uh, finding the best solution is, is not always straightforward. And Sophie, uh, tagging on the point that um, Torbjorn just made about you have highly connected cities and unconnected cities. And if you were looking at our roadmap um, to talk to people about some of those rural and innovative solutions in part of the country versus the highly connected, if you look at, if you're in Tbilisi, in Georgia, there's connectivity in the main capital, way out in the regions, highly mountainous country, poor, not as connected. What kind of roadmap would you, as if you're going in from the ITU side, give them? So. We mentioned all these um, discussions that are taking place, uh, the Digital Economy Task Force, all these various task forces. 
One of the conclusions that I've, I've and I've participated in a couple of them in the, in the, in the last few weeks, one of the things I always came out in every one of them is that we really, connectivity is not just supply, it's demand and supply. As you say, ICTs are all pervasive. Even grand, grandmothers are worrying about it because they hear about IoT and fridges and, and, and the TV following them. So I, ICTs are all pervasive. Half of the world is online. So we need to think of the opportunities, but we cannot forget the trust in ICTs. And so coming out of all these meetings, I always say, even we at ITU, we're working, working on infrastructure maps, but I think overlapping those maps with the demand will really help us get a clear vision on where the gaps are in terms of regulation, in terms of investment, in terms of financing. So really that mapping, I think when we talk about mm -hmm. mapping, mm -hmm. not just we need to think about ICT infrastructure, alternative infrastructure, and overlay it with some of the applications. Mm -hmm. And there's some of the people here in the room where we're trying to do that with in terms of digital financial mm -hmm. inclusion. Um, and then another thing, you mentioned your study of 2015, Torbjorn. In 2015 at the GSR, we did our first building blocks for collaborative regulation, and everybody was, wow, that's so innovative. <laughs> that's such a great idea. And yet today we're faced with the fact that we can't escape from that collaborative regulatory measures because if we really want to achieve digital transformation, we need to get people in government talking together. We can't afford for the health ministry to go and build out their own ICT infrastructure. We can't afford what happened in the 1990s and 2000, connecting schools. And I'm not talking about the ITU, <laughs> uh, about the ITU projects. I'm talking about some country-specific projects or being in Africa where schools were connected and they got languages they couldn't understand. And the, and the computers stayed in boxes because yes. they mm. didn't get First of all, the, they didn't get the connectivity that was needed for the particular equipment. They didn't get the, gui the user's guide. They didn't they get the training. They didn't get the, 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 the projects weren't sustainable so as to be able to maintain or train the teachers. And the computer classes weren't even included in the national <laughs> syllabus. So they weren't even allowed to teach about computer skills. So really, two things I want to leave you with is Let's really think about a holistic mapping when we do mapping, mm. and the, also the collaborative regulatory measures. We're going to present our first toolkit and data research we've done on collaborative regulation, mm. what we call the fifth generation of regulation, not 5B, 5G, <laughs> but the fifth generation of regulation, collaborative regulation, and some real <coughs> guidelines on where we see that collaboration that needs to take place and how to formalize it or go through MOUs or go through some looser collaboration. But the fact of the matter is that collaboration has to take place. Is that today? Our session is today <laughs> in GSR. Uh, that's from the 9th to the 12th of July in Vanuatu. That's we'll, where we'll be presenting data, evidence, and some uh, guiding measures. I'm going to turn to Valeria with one last question and then open it up to the floor. We all have about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, but Valeria, one thing that you had touched on earlier, and I know from the work that you've done, and we've seen it in Mexico uh, with the social purpose licensing, and you mentioned it earlier, indigenous communities, and I want to highlight this is in the United States with our Native American population, Canada with their First Nations communities, in Mexico with their large indigenous populations, in Ecuador, throughout Latin America. That's an acute issue on the connectivity side. Is that something you're focusing on uh, with APC and your com community network project, the indigenous connectivity issues? Because we've seen so many licenses given out to big operators that skip over the communities themselves. So how can community networks help? Well, obviously, um, uh, one part of our focus is to work with marginalized groups, and obviously indigenous groups have been historically marginalized and deprived from 
the benefits of uh, not only social and economic development. So um, there is a very nice experience that you might be familiar with, which is Rizomatica, working specifically uh, with community networks in Mexico to bring mobile telephony through GSM. Uh, and that's an initiative that is ve ve being taken as a reference to expanding this type of uh, um, initiatives to other uh, areas in Latin America. Um, uh, what we have found is that uh, uh, the, in these low-income communities, the reduction of the cost for accessing to communication services uh, is substantial, and, that's, and r those are resources that the community can then uh, use collectively for development purposes. Um, uh, uh, Rizomatica and Redes and other organizations working together in collaboration with APC, we are systematizing these experiences, trying to understand better what the impact is. What we have found is that obviously in the last five years, in particular, these initiatives, e whether and irrespective they are uh, targeting specifically indigenous, indigenous communities or other marjan marginalized groups, are still in early stages. But it is important to understand uh, what the, the challenges are, what the impact so far is, because we, we, we do feel that uh, there are many areas that have to be addressed uh, yet before community networks actually reach their full potential. But these initiatives, I think, are already providing very strong evidence that, um, uh, that this, um, this new paradigm, this model, have, uh, have specific benefits for communities, particularly ones uh, such as indig indigenous people that have been histori historically marginalized. So the, the, my call is for everyone to keep supporting this, perhaps give a little bit more time to actually look at the, uh, at the impact and to understand the best ways to um, strengthen uh, this type of initiatives towards, you know, not only strengthening the movement as a whole, but also uh, in, in terms of uh, establishing mechanisms to work with different uh, stakeholders and be able to provide an enabling environment, not only in, at, at the local community, but also nationally, and to be able to find solutions to bridge the digital gap. And thank you, and I think, Sophie, you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, because I think that's a very interesting, the indigenous communities. I think in terms of building blocks, what's your vision? How do you want, who do you want to include in the digital economy. And right. don't, forget, uh, don't forget the unserved, the underserved areas, the marginalized communities, the people with dis persons with disabilities. Build that, in t that vision. Who do I want to include? So what is the process that I will adopt, including who are the players that will be allowed to bid for licenses? What are the evaluation criteria? Will I build this vision into my evaluation criteria? Will I do like Portugal that 50% of the evaluation criteria is innovative information society projects? And then as regulators, don't forget monitoring, enforcement, and sanctions. What are the rights and obligations that are in your legal and regulatory framework and or in the licenses reflected verbatim or through cross-referencing your legal and regulatory framework, and then never forget monitoring, enforcement, and sanctions, because operators will only follow the rules if you impose them, <laughs> and if you actually write them into your licenses. So you need to make sure your vision, your process, your rights and obligations, and then monitoring enforcement and sanctions. Don't be afraid of sanctioning, because if you want to achieve that vision, impose it. And if you want to think about other ways to get those licensing obligations met for the bigger companies, partner with a community exactly. network. Someone said, Jane, that's a crazy idea. I said, why is it crazy? If the return on investment is not there, we heard from GSMA in a study in 2016 at the IGF that for villages of 5,000 and under, the return on investment for traditional mobile operators is not there. Okay, so then what? They're not gonna provide the service because they can't get the return on investment? No, there's very innovative solutions coming from some of the mobile operators. Telefonica is trying to work in Peru on a solution with some rural communities. The companies can actually come to the table with community networks and say to the community network, I'll give you backhaul, we'll cut a deal, 
you provide that service in that region, and it's part of my licensing obligation can be fulfilled. As Sophie is saying, there's some innovative ways of looking at this perspective from a different prism, not your traditional regulatory prism. Because if we still have half the planet not connected, those that want to be connected, let's be clear, like my, my father <laughs> doesn't care. He loves his newspaper. My mother cares about her phone. However, there are people who want to be connected and that aren't. To Lee's point about the, lo the local and uh, the national process with um, WTO obligations, that can be very imposing. But we can work through Lee to figure out ways to talk more about some solutions that we're seeing with Sophie on the ITU side, with Torbjorn at the UNCTAD side. This isn't, um, as you're saying, Sophie, and everyone here on the panel is saying, it's a blended way of looking, whether it's blended financing, by the way, I'll put out a, a push for that, buzzword. <laughs> uh, buzzword. Um, <laughs> you've got to look at better solutions for getting money out into these projects. And that's something I should put a plug in for. These are startups. And most of the economy that you just highlighted, Torbjorn, and the companies that didn't exist 10 years ago were startups. The Oaxaca project that the Mexican government looked at, that's a new startup in the, in the traditional sense of how do we get connectivity out there? I'm going to take a chance. We provide small financing. Um, I know ITU does great projects. WTO is looking at you know, training people, same with UNCTAD. It's all to start up that mentality of how to bring that change together through the different parties. Um, there's no one single solution, I'm afraid to say, but there are lots of different good principles from the WTO to UNCTAD to what APC is doing, ISOC, and uh, the ITU. So do you have any questions in our audience for anyone here? We've got about 11 minutes, 10 minutes uh, in the back of the room. Could you speak loudly and uh, we'll go forward? Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, it's Lula from South Africa. I just want to, it's not a question for me, it's just a comment to just simply reinforce the point that was actually raised by Sophie, to say if we are going to be able to look at uh, some forms of uh, policy and regulatory reforms to ensure that we deal with the challenges that are faced with community networks, it would be important that this uh, sort of a dialogue we take it to the developmental sector. There's a question under study group uh, 5.1 uh, that is actually much more relevant to this, to be able to actually compile some of these experiences and uh, we'll be able to actually produce uh, guidelines as well. So I think that would be very important for us and uh, all of us, especially to actually get reports that will enable us to actually have a dialogue at the national level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Um, the work in the study group in the ITUD, um, the, the colleague from South Africa was mentioning um, question 5-1. And you may say to yourself, it's a question? Well, it's a question for study for four years. They're looking at rural remote connectivity options. So this is a perfect opportunity to bring in some of this panel's knowledge. Mm -hmm. We actually participate, uh, APCs participating, the ITUD staff have a great wealth of knowledge that they bring to the table. So thank you for that, because some governments have been afraid of community networks. And uh, we heard somebody say they're rebels, they don't get licenses, you know, what are these people doing? And we said, no, 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 it's different. In your country, you find the solution, you find a way. <laughs> it's not that they're pirates, because um, I got accused of promoting pirate networks in Buenos Aires, where my colleague Sebastian's from BA. I said, Sebastian, they're, they're saying that these are pirate networks. And he's like, we'll work on it, we'll work on it, Jane. So I rely on Sebastian to help calm me down when I'm <laughs> trying to figure things out. And by the way, he's on a panel with APC on Thursday at 16.30. Yes. On more on community networks, so stay tuned for that. Um, and we had two more questions over here and then Mary Duma after. So please. Hello, my name is Gonzalo Lopez Barajas and I work for Telefonica. We are providers of telecommunication services in most of Latin American countries. That would be Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Colombia, so Mexico. So pretty much from now, from Mexico to the south of, of South America. I would just wanted to add a comment that I, I agree pretty much with the enabling environment uh, that uh, the representative from APC was mentioning. And of course, uh, a spectrum and taxation, that would be two relevant aspects. So would be very happy 
to have these neutral and, and impartial conditions because access to a spectrum is a very relevant cost for us and also taxation of uh, handsets, of equipment, of even the, the services affect very much the affordability of the services that we provide. So in order to make profitable the services that you mentioned that actually are not profitable, if we were having these, these um, um, assets, these elements, having a much more um, enabling uh, conditions. For example, we would have some conditions for the urban areas and other conditions for the uh, rural areas that would help much. And in that regard, as you was mentioning, we have launched a new initiative in, in Peru, Internet Para Todos, in which we are innovating in, in the ways in which we can make this business profitable. So we have teamed up with Facebook, we have teamed up with, uh, with CAF, we have teamed up with the BID, and, and all of four of us are partners of this initiative, and we have created a new mobile wholesale provider which is open to all access uh, to all mobile operators. And basically, our aim with the, there in Peru is to expand connectivity to all the rural areas in, in the country. So we have a new approach. We are looking in ways uh, to innovate in technology, to reduce down the cost of the network deployment. We have new partners that, uh, that are helping us to finance these activities. This is a new initiative because it's open, not just to the, whole to the mobile operators, but also to the local communities because we aim to partner with uh, with local communities in order to have maintenance work, to have resales. So this is a, a completely new approach that we are doing uh, in order to expand connectivity in all the country that we, of course, would like to, to expand to the whole of Latin America. Bravo. And that's, that's exactly what we're talking about with the innovation that companies are doing and working with the different partners. And you mentioned CAF, which is a big bank, Facebook, who most people know Facebook. But some of the companies are taking this broader look with the development banks, with the companies to try and, and provide that. And I would just give a shout out to the ITUD's America's office, um, who will be partnering with the Internet Society and some others, CAF, um, to look at community networks and a toolkit. So this could be a, a very important case study for that toolkit in Citel. And Sebastian knows more about it than I do. <laughs> you can talk to him. Um, Mary, and then I think here in the middle. Uh, Mary Duma in the back. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Mary Uduma. I'm from Nigeria. Um, I, I, I came in late, but I've listened and uh, gotten a lot from um, the panelists. Um, my first question is to Sophia. Um, I like the idea of 5G regulation, but uh, in crafting in the, in, um, in the conversation of uh, bringing other regulators together? Do you speak to the, the, the adjacent technologies regulators? For instance, those in uh, environment and those in power, because those are two things that plague um, operators um, whenever they, 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 even when they want to go to the rural areas, um, apart from the multiple taxation that uh, we have had, but this conversation of bringing in the non, well, the, there's the non-state actors and there is the adjacent technologies and uh, where do, do you bring them in? And um, at WTO, again, I want to ask, are the conversations with other, uh, other technologies, uh, non-state actors and other adjacent technologies that will promote uh, connectivity at rural area? And, um, Again, is ITU um, um, thinking of how to come up with um, social spectrum? Social spectrum in the sense that that spectrum is available for those that want to offer social services in the rural areas so that the towers will not, uh, the tower owners will not ask us to pay 25 thousand US dollars but you know a, a neutral one or a lower one that could help the connecting communities uh, thrive thank you so we have two questions 5g related maybe we can take them quickly uh, Sophie and then Lee on inclusion so first and foremost it's not five let's let's not get confused 
by my own bad use of the term. So it's not 5G regulation. We call it G5, so as not to get confused with 5G. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I think I actually get them. So it's G5 re regulation, the fifth generation of regulation, which is collaborative regulation. Mm. We actually started, as I said, we started this in 2015. Uh, where we started our research and, and really the, the building blocks for collaborative regulation. In 2016 at the GSR, we really looked at um, digital financial inclusion where we had the global dialogue on, on di GDDFI, global dialogue on digital financial inclusion where we brought the financial sector regulators as, and as you know, we've been doing quite a lot of work uh, with the focus group on DFS. Um, now the research we're carrying out, we're looking at data protection, competition, and of course energy. We know that energy is vital, and we're also look at, we're, we're looking at health and finance. So that's where we're starting with our build, building blocks and reaching out to these other regulators. So again, um, hold that thought because we'll be presenting. We had uh, some, some basic studies that have already been done, and mm -hmm. we will be presenting the, the initial toolbox at GSR. Social spectrum, I'll leave to my colleagues from the BR <laughs> who are not here right now, but I'm sure we can get back to you on that. And Mary, the Mexican regulator has done a lot on this, and Colombia is looking at it, Argentina is, uh, it's not called social purpose licensing in Argentina, but there's some amazing examples from Latin America right now um, that could be used. Uh, to take a look at the unlicensed spectrum, just as a plug from our side, <laughs> unlicensed spectrum is amazing for mesh network development. It has yeah. paved the way in many countries yeah. with a different mindset shift, whether it's TV white space. And as Valeria had said, there's secondary use, shared use, direct allocations. So that's, that's a topic we'd be happy to talk to you about forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also a plug for community radio too, because there's some areas of the world where that's, the spectrum can't penetrate the foliage at a certain uh, distance and frequency. Mm -hmm. um, and Brazil is looking at this, Mexico has looked at this, and others where you've got a different way of uh, sharing and focus. Lee, I'll turn to you on the stakeholder side. Yeah, well, as to whether the conversation uh, about connectivity in the WTO relates to rural areas, I think implicitly it can't do anything else. I mean, connectivity is something that is always mentioned uh, by almost all members as something important. Currently, we're in the context of electronic commerce, but it's become a two-edged sword for us. It's become a political football for us at WTO because you have those who say, well, we need to move forward and do the best sort of regulatory sort of ecosystem that we can to the extent that trade affects that because we have so many people in rural areas or people in countries that are not connected. And you have the people who say the fact that so many people aren't connected is a reason that we should not move forward in WTO. So it's sort of a dichotomy that it's hard to find a, a, a compromise if both sides are convinced that the other side's approach is completely wrong. Um, one of the things to point out, though, is uh, that would be relevant to the unconnected, who are primarily in rural areas. I mean, I, I, I pester Torbjorn about talking about the, the, the figures on who's buying, and I know the figures aren't very good on, on who's selling. But from the trade perspective, you want to see who of the unconnected have the potential to sell things you know, and then increase their standard of living and, and, and promote not only economic growth, but growth of their own, you know, sort of business potential. I don't think you're going to have uh, rural people who are better connected to IoT and other kinds of apps who are going to become IBM overnight, but, you know, that's not the point. That's where I feel that small results can make a big difference in small situations. So it is part of the conversation, but it's, it's giving us a little trouble even to talk about connectivity at the moment, uh, depending on whether you think the glass is half full or half empty. And in sum, um, first, thank you for being here. We appreciate uh, the fact that you stayed with us. Also, thank you to everyone on the panel excellent work being done across different organizations and representative of many different stakeholders and many of you in the room. I see regulators, we have Telefonica, Facebook and others here. You've got companies who are trying to create that connectivity, bridging those divides for the digital inclusion that Sophie and others were talking about. So don't just think of UNCTAD as, okay, those, those scary trade guys, they have an ICT for Deep program this fabulous brochure on e-trade readiness. 
because that's going to push things forward in your country in a different way with Lee and the, the national discussions from the trade negotiators get in there, mm -hmm. get the stakeholder groups in. Valeria with APC and the great work they've been doing and they're an amazing partner of the internet societies and, and others in the room. The work matters at that local level with the different actors in the room. And Sophie, thank you so much from the ITU side of everything you're doing. And thank you again, great to be here. And there's a panel on Thursday at 1630 on Community Networks. And Sophie has a workshop today at 2.30, yes? Okay, so thank you very much. We appreciate you being here and help us support different connectivity options. All right.